Hello EFD squad and welcome to a new strand called One on One. On this show, a member of the FD team will be taking you through a topic that requires a little bit more care and attention than we can normally give on the channel. Now obviously here on EFD and on FD, we pride ourselves on backing up what we're saying with statistics. And you might have noticed over the last couple of years that we've gone from talking just about shots and key passes to talking about expected goals and expected assists. And some of you have asked us to cover it in a little bit more detail to explain to you what it is and why it matters. So that's why I'm here today as the nominated XG fetishist on the Football Daily team. Now the headline is that expected goals basically measures the quality of shots that a team takes. Now you can create a simple expected goals model just using the location of the shot, but actually sophisticated expected goals models take a bunch of different factors into account. Whether the shot came from a foot or somebody's head, whether a player went around the keeper, whether it was a cutback or a through ball that led to the shot, the speed of the attack that led to the shot, loads of different factors go into deciding how good a chance it actually is. So straight away, you can probably see the advantages over just looking at shot numbers. If a player takes six shots in the game, I have no idea whether he's just banging them from range or whether he's actually getting on the end of good chances. Maybe he's beating a guy on the dribble. Maybe he's gone around the keeper. I don't know if he's Messi or Andros Townsend. So if I have expected goals data to hand, then it gives me a lot more information. Uh, if I'm scouting a young player and he's taken a bunch of shots in a game, then I might think that's somebody we need to look at. But if I see that they're all from 30 yards out, then I might think, one, he lacks match intelligence, two, maybe he lacks the skill to get opportunities closer to goal, and I'll be a little bit more agnostic about how good he actually is. And the same thing goes for chances created. Expected goals has a kind of sister metric called expected assists. Now let's say I'm a central midfielder and I lump four long balls into the box and my striker is really, really good with his head. Let's say it's Olivier Giroud. He manages to get to every one of those long balls and get a kind of weak header on goal. Now that means that I'll get credited with four key passes. But the good thing about expected assists is it'll rate me much lower than somebody who completes four through balls into the box. It's gonna show that the quality of chance he's created is much, much better. And as a result, the scout looking at this data will have a good idea of who is the better player. Now, the thing is, a lot of people object to expected goals because they think there's too much data in the game. They don't really like the numbers. They think it takes away from their enjoyment. But actually, the thing I like about expected goals is it's kind of intuitive. We kind of already do it as football fans. Now, if I watch a game and my team has all the ball, we have a ton of shots. And the reason we don't score is because the keeper has an unbelievable match then we end up losing because the other side have a shot from 40 yards that takes a huge deflection and manages to go in. After the game, I'm gonna to say to my friends, we were unlucky to lose, we had the best chances in the game. Now what I'm doing is essentially a form of expected goals. I'm rating how good my team's chances were versus the other teams and deciding what that tells me about the two sides. Even FIFA has a kind of expected goals model built into it. If I shoot from the halfway line every match, should I expect those shots to go in as often as if I'm creating big chances through on goal, one on one with the keeper? FIFA can tell the difference between those shots. It can tell which one is more likely to go in. And as a result, they're making a judgment about which shots are more likely to go in in real life too. And here's why this matters. When it comes to predicting future performance, and this, this is gonna sound insane, expected goals is actually much, much better at telling us how good teams are and how good players are than real goals. Now, the reason for this is that we've all seen players and teams go on hot streaks where a striker just manages to finish anything or where a goalkeeper stops absolutely everything that comes at him, like, say, David De Gea last season. But what you want to do is see whether a team can consistently create high-quality chances because that's the kind of ability that persists. If a team wins games because they manage to bang some goals in from 40 yards out, that's unlikely to carry on in the long term. But if they're constantly creating big chances in front of goal, you will likely see that start to bear fruit over the course of the season. Now that obviously doesn't work in a single game because anything can happen in a single game. And we're also not saying that having a great keeper or a great striker doesn't make a team better. If your keeper can save a bunch of really close range shots, that's absolutely amazing but you will still want to know if there's an issue with your defense. If one of your forwards is able to score consistently from outside the box, again, that's a really nice weapon to have in your side, but you kind of want to know why he's having to do that in order to get you wins. And if you're not creating big chances closer into goal, then maybe you need to adjust your tactics. But of course, expected goals isn't perfect. It's just the best tool we have at the moment. 
So what are some of the problems? Now, the way expected goals models are built is that all the shots, as far back as we have data, tend to get plugged into the machine. So every shot from, say, the right-hand corner of the six-yard box will go into it, and then that will be used to calculate the probability that a future shot from that area will go in. Now, the problem with that is that there's no distinction between good finishers and bad finishers, and we know that finishing skill does exist. So expected goals is kind of agnostic about the quality of player taking the shot. However, while finishing skill is important, and this is another thing that's gonna sound crazy, it's actually not as important as you probably think it is. In fact, there are very few players in world football who consistently outperform their expected goals. If you look at the XG number produced by a striker, you're probably getting a pretty good idea of what you can expect from that guy. For example, in the last five seasons, Cristiano Ronaldo has only overperformed his expected goals tally once. Last year, he scored 26, XG had him at 27. In 1617, he got 25, XG was at 25.4. In 15-16, he got 35, and XG was at 35.6. And actually, Robert Lewandowski, another guy who's considered an excellent finisher, is about the same. He runs pretty much level with what expected goals predicts. Now, the really good thing there is that expected goals was very close in pretty much all those cases, which suggests that the model kind of mimics real life pretty well. And it also tells us about what we should actually value in a striker. Ronaldo and Lewandowski are world-class strikers, but it's their amazing ability to get high quality chances close into goal, which makes them special, not finishing those chances at an above average rate. So that's problem one. Problem two is that XG doesn't know where defenders are. Most XG models don't have tracking data built into them, which means that when they judge a shot location, they don't know how many defenders are between the guy taking the shot and the goal. That's why they have stuff like through balls and counterattacks built into the model as a kind of loose way of telling how set the defense is and how much pressure the shooter is likely to face. Now, this probably explains why coaches like Lucien Favre and Sean Dyche tend to overperform expected goals defensively because they have a lot of guys between the shooter and the goal making blocks. And as a result, XG doesn't know that those shots are actually a lot harder to finish than they seem. And nobody's saying that expected goals should replace the eye test. The good thing about stats in football is it allows you to whittle down a huge number of players that you should look at, for instance, if you're scouting, to one or two. So that's a situation where you'd want to watch footage and see what was actually going on on the pitch. And this is kind of a myth about stats in football. A lot of people say that statisticians don't really want to watch the game and don't pay attention. They think you should only sign players, for instance, based on their statistics and nobody is arguing for that. There are so many players in the world, there are so many leagues that you need a way to whittle those down to a shortlist that you can send scouts out to watch. And expected goals, shots, key passes, all these sorts of numbers help us do that. And even if you think expected goals is bull important people in football disagree. Clubs like Arsenal, Liverpool, Borussia Dortmund and PSG are all known to use data both in their scouting and in their assessment of their own team and professional bettors and betting companies use them as well, which is how they set prices and how they beat the bookies themselves. So expected goals and advanced stats in general are going to be a part of the future of the game. And to be honest, the sooner you get used to it, the better. So that's our explanation of XG. And to be clear, we're not telling you not to watch the games. It's just a tool to give you a little bit more information. So that was the first episode of One on One. And if you liked it, then please actually drop us a like and let us know what you thought of it in the comments below, how we could improve it and any topics you'd like to see us cover in future, especially if you have an idea of who on the FD team would do a good job. And as always, make sure that you've subscribed to the channel. We'll see you next time.